Hello viewers, for DIYers here with another tutorial video for everyone. In this particular video here, I'll be showing you how to install a double DIN Android head unit in a first generation Toyota Tacoma. This head unit is made by Pumpkin. A link to this will be included in the description below. This tutorial will also cover how to install the backup camera, navigation antenna, hands-free microphone, and Wi-Fi antenna. I have installed Pumpkin's previous version in a Ford Ranger, and if you're seeking more information on a different vehicle, be sure to check that out. This is Pumpkin's new Android 9.0 interface, 8-core processor, 4 gigs of RAM, and 32 gigs of storage. I'll be releasing a review video next week, so be sure to keep an eye out for that. I'll cover all the features with a complete walkthrough. Here's a comparison between the new head unit and the factory Toyota unit. This will fit in the dashboard with light modifications. The factory mounting brackets also work with a mild modification as well. Included with this head unit is a ISO harness. I have already installed the Toyota specific harness, which you'll see further on in the video. There is also two inline fuses, which is a slightly different design than compared to their older unit. Micro USB cable, extended USB cable, double USB cable, Wi-Fi antenna, hands-free microphone, backup camera, video cable for the backup camera, generic brackets with fasteners, and GPS antenna. First is disconnecting the battery as we are working with an electrical system here. Remove a lower trim panel below the radio bezel. When I bought this truck, the interior was partially apart and some of the fasteners were missing, so I'll try to do my best to cover what's missing. This trim piece should have two push-in clips, one on each side as shown by the exposed holes. Push in the center of the clip, then remove, and the panel can be lifted out. Next is disconnecting the electrical components on the rear. For this I have two 12 volt power ports and the factory security LED. Here's the back side of the panel and as you can see there is two snap clips. One along the top on the right side and another along the left side. Remove the ashtray, depress the top metal portion and pull straight out. There will be a Phillips screw on the bottom which needs to be removed. For the HVAC panel, pull off the rotational knobs. They simply slide into their location. They have an alignment groove so their position can't be mixed up. If your fingers are too large, use a nylon trim tool to unclip the HVAC panel. Start from the outer hole and move your way across the panel. Here's a view of the backside. Remove the two Phillips screws hidden behind the HVAC panel holding on the bezel. Using a nylon trim tool, you can start at the top or bottom, it doesn't really matter. Carefully pry around the radio bezel. There will be various clips around the trim. Take your time, especially in the cold, as you can crack the plastic. Disconnect the plug on the rear for the passenger side airbag. This has a yellow connector with a spring-loaded locking latch that needs to be pushed back when disconnecting. Disconnect the cigarette lighter at the bottom. Then remove a light in the ashtray which pulls out. I used pliers for added grip. A view of the back side. You can see there is two mounting points for the Phillips screws around the HVAC panel. Two snap clips at the top. Two more snap clips on each side around the radio. One snap clip under the radio and another below the cigarette lighter. Then there is one screw below the ashtray and another view where the radio bezel was. As you can see, there is four 8mm bolts holding in the radio. Make sure you remove the CD if your radio still has one in, as you won't be able to retrieve it after once disconnected. I had to hook up the battery for this. Then remove the four 8mm bolts, two on each side of the radio. Pull the radio straight out. Pull out the antenna wire, it just slides into place. The electrical connector on the rear comes out in two pieces. There will be tabs which are depressed, unclip it, and then remove. The Wi-Fi antenna will be installed behind the pillar trim, just like I did in the Ranger. To remove the pillar trim on the Tacoma, pop out the two fastener covers using a small standard screwdriver. Then remove the two 10mm bolts holding on the pull handle. Remove the handle. Pull off the door gasket which snaps into place. Watch out for any butyl tape as it can be a bit messy to clean up. Start at the top of the trim. 
and pull it off. There will be two clips in behind. Then lift up slightly as there is a tab on the bottom portion. If a clip stays into place, use pliers to compress, remove, and then reinstall on the plastic pillar trim. The wiring will be ran behind the dashboard, therefore the glove box needs to be dropped down. Compress in the sides of the glove box to disconnect the clips and pull down. Next is removing the upper panel above the glove box. There will be three 10mm bolts holding it in place, two at the top corners and one behind the latch. Using a nylon trim tool, unclip the panel by the dashboard side, unclip it on the sides as well and pull down. No need to disconnect those wires in behind. Ensure the area is clean where you are gluing on the antenna. Use isopropanol alcohol to wipe the surface. Remove the paper off the adhesive, then firmly press the antenna into place. The higher the antenna, the better the reception. Feed the wires behind the dashboard and pillar. The wire gets fed through the dashboard and over to the radio opening. You'll need a light to view where the wire is inside the dashboard. I have fed the cable behind the metal reinforcement tubing closer to the firewall. The airbag is here, make sure the cable doesn't interfere with that. There is also an HVAC duct actuator, so keep the wires away from that as well. In order to keep the wire into place, I used butyl tape. Rip off a short portion, double it up so it is a bit thicker and it can form around the wire when it's pressed into place. Then stick the wire into place. This will prevent the wire from rattling or having it pinched between any trim or clips. Here's a quick view of how I ran the wires. Use cable ties as needed to keep the installation clean and so the wire is kept safe away from any moving components. When done here, reinstall the panel above the glove box, snap it into place first, then reinstall the three 10mm bolts. Don't clip the glove box in just yet. A view of the Wi-Fi antenna before the pillar trim gets installed. Here's a view behind the pillar trim as a reference. This is both the driver and passenger side. Snap the pillar trim back into place. Push the door gasket back into place. Reinstall the pull handle. Tighten the two 10mm bolts. Then install the two fastener caps. Moving on to the driver's side, this is where the hands-free microphone will be ran. First is removing the door gasket. Then grab onto the top portion of the trim, pull out to unclip it, and then pull it up slightly to disconnect the alignment tab at the bottom. Remove the knee panel on the driver's side. This is the easiest way I've found to run the wires instead of reaching up behind the dash. There will be four 10mm bolts, and I believe there is one Phillips screw just under the dimmer switch, however mine is missing. There will also be two more screws holding on the hood latch release. Pull off the panel, there will be various clips which needs to be disconnected. Once off, here is a view of the back side of the panel so you can see the clip locations. To run the backup camera wire, I also needed access under the carpet. Remove the four Phillips screws, then pull up the trim along the rocker. Next is removing the kick panel. Grab onto the bottom and pull back. On the back side, you can see the alignment tabs. On the previous install for the Ford Ranger, I used the supplied clip for the hands-free microphone to clip it onto the sun visor. This clip doesn't open wide enough for the Tacoma sun visor, and the headliner doesn't allow for the wire to be easily hidden, so instead I'll do something a little different here. Removing the map light using a small standard screwdriver, pop up the center trim cap. Then using a nylon trim tool, unclip the cover, prying at the base. Remove the four Phillips screws holding on the map light base. Don't mix up the screws, there are two different types here. Then disconnect the wire plug on the rear to press the tab and pull out. I'm dropping the headliner down slightly so I can run the microphone wire. Remove a sun visor, there are two Phillips screws holding it into place on the fixed pivot part. Unclip it from the lock and remove. To remove a latch there is another Phillips screw. Then pull that out. If you have a sunroof, remove the rubber molding around the opening. I used a nylon trim tool to pop it out as it sits firmly into place. Pull the door gasket out at the top. There will be bracing on the inside of the roof where the wires can be ran. You may need the assistance of something stiffer to pull the wire through, which I ended up using. There will be an opening just past the sunroof mounting point, and this is where the wire exits before going down the pillar. 
When pulling down the headliner, be extremely careful not to crease the material. Reinstall the sunroof opening molding. Considering there is already a harness running down the pillar, I'm using cable ties to attach the microphone wire in place. Use as many as you need to keep the wire free of getting pinched in between the clips or trim. Trim the cable ties using side cutters or bullnose cutters. Feed the wire between the dashboard and pillar to the underside. Again, it's fed behind the metal tube brace on the firewall side. The wire is routed around the HVAC duct and it follows the factory wiring to keep it safe away from any components where it can get damaged. The factory cable ties were opened up just enough to feed the wire through so there wasn't any need for additional cable ties. And finally, it's over to the radio opening. Here's a view of the microphone wire on the pillar. Another view of the microphone wire under the dash, then running along the factory harness. Now is installing the pillar trim. Align the lower tab and then snap it back into place. Push the door gasket back into place. Reinstall the sun visor clip along with the sun visor. I left the longer wire exposed for the microphone. It can be tucked up inside the roof when the light gets installed. The tab left on the clip was removed using bullnose cutters, then touched up with a file. I have already pre-drilled a hole for the microphone on the base to fit through. I use a step drill which does a clean hole on the aluminum base. The size of the hole should match the microphone's diameter. Next is drilling the cover, again using the same process. I use the closest size step drill I had and align the hole roughly so it doesn't interfere with any components. The step drill does leave a very clean hole in the plastic as well. Once done here you can see the finalized hole. This will allow for a clean, factory-looking install of the microphone in a generalized location for all occupants. Feed the microphone through the base and then screw it into place. Make sure you don't mix up the screws. Then attach the microphone to the cover. If someone has an alternative way for mounting this microphone, please share it in the comments below. I used some hot glue to hold it into place. If it does need to be removed, it can be. The glue should cleanly break away with a little force and it can be reapplied again. Then feed the wire into the roof and snap the cover back into place. Make sure that wire isn't pinched anywhere. And finally snap the cap around the mirror base. Once that little foam cover is in place, the microphone is in a safe place where it doesn't interfere with any other components in the truck. Moving on to the backup camera now, the video wire is fed through the floor under the driver's seat. Pull back the tape on the factory wiring, then insert the camera wire through here. Once you have the wiring finalized, the tape will need to be replaced so the grommet is sealed up again. The wiring is ran along the same route, so you'll need to go under the truck. Considering it is exposed to the elements, split loop casing is highly recommended to protect the wire and you'll see this casing in a moment. Remove the taillight. There will be four Phillips screws holding it into place. There are two different sized screws here, so don't mix them up. Pull out the taillight. The reverse camera wire requires a switched power source for the reverse lights and ground. I will be cutting both wires for the bulb. Using a razor knife, cut off about 3 quarters of an inch of casing to expose the conductor inside. Here I will be using a lineman splice. Strip the wires on the supplied power plug for the camera. Red goes to the positive and black goes to the negative. This can be checked with a multimeter. Verify your truck just to be safe. For this truck, I found the green to be positive and the white is negative. There also needs to be an additional power switching wire for the camera cable to the head unit. I did cut a length of red 18 gauge wire, again using a lineman splice to the green power wire. This is the same length as the camera power cable. When the soldering is done, I used liquid tape to seal up the connections from any moisture or water. Due to the cold weather, I had to apply this in three coats. It's best to warm up the liquid tape by taking it indoors for the night, as the cold can make it quite thick. Allow it to dry in between coats. Those wires were then ran down to the taillight area and over to the bumper. The video cable wire from the cab was routed behind the bumper and not inside the taillight area. The red wire was soldered to the video cable wire, then I used adhesive filled shrink tube for a waterproof connection. Next the wires were tied off using cable ties, together holding everything in place. 
Finally is installing the remaining section of split loop casing. This is available in a variety of sizes. Pick the size according to which fits around your connections. The split loop casing will protect those wires from the elements such as road debris, water, snow or whatever else may jeopardize their condition. Install the backup camera into place. Unlike the other version I installed with fasteners on the license plate cover, this one just bolts up using the license plate mounting holes. Just make sure that those fasteners are long enough. Plug in the power and video wires. Then install the split loop casing. Mine is a smaller diameter so one connection was installed in one section. Then an additional section was for the other connector. Everything was closed up using electrical tape. And finally the wires were pushed back into place behind the bumper. I used cable ties to hold it all together, keeping the wiring safe and clean. For the external dual USB hookup, this was ran in the glove box. This can be mounted anywhere you'd like. The center console would also be another option. Using a step drill again, I picked an appropriate size for the wires and drilled a hole in the back of the glove box. On the Ranger, I left the wires hanging down and cable tied them into place. However, the Tacoma doesn't allow for this and the wires may fall in behind. The wires were then cable tied together and fed through the hole over to the radio opening. For the head unit's wiring, as mentioned earlier, I did cut off the ISO plug on the harness as it's not compatible with this truck. When the wiring was done in the Ranger, I did cut a fair amount of wire off to keep this harness short. However, in this case, there are inline fuses, which is a nice safety feature, so I'd like to keep those. The Tacoma does have quite a bit of room inside the dash, especially since the new head unit is shallower, therefore there shouldn't be any issues pushing back that wiring. All the wires which will be used were stripped. As a test run, I did match up all the wires, twisted them together, and then wrapped the conductor in electrical tape. This is a great way to ensure it's working correctly in your vehicle. If any mistakes are made after soldering, then it's harder to fix. I purchased a vehicle specific plug and play connector for the Tacoma. This method is highly recommended as you don't have to cut up the factory wiring, the installation is much cleaner, and if you part ways with your vehicle, you can keep the head unit and reinstall the factory one. These plug and play harnesses can be purchased at your local auto parts store, some big box stores also carry these, electronic store or online. The plug and play harness does come with a wiring diagram and Pumpkin also supplies a wiring diagram as well. Typically the colors are generic but just verify everything to be safe. Pumpkin also labels their wiring to make the process easier. Next is removing the electrical tape. Unfortunately with this plug and play harness I couldn't remove the extra plugs as it still leaves exposed wires and won't allow for a cleaner install. On the Ranger I did modify the harness to remove the unwanted plugs. Straighten out the wire strands. Crimped connections can also be used, however they do pose problems when not done correctly and they don't always look as nice. I am using color coded shrink tube which is sized accordingly to the wire gauge. Make sure the shrink tube is installed before the joint is soldered. Work in a well ventilated area. This is a flux core solder and the type of connections here I'm using is known as a western splice. If you are seeking more information on soldering, I do have a video for that, so be sure to check it out. Try to untangle the wires so everything lays fairly smooth before making the connections. I soldered a few at a time and then heated up the shrink tube. This is just a regular form of shrink tube. The connections inside the truck won't be exposed to any excessive amounts of moisture, so there's no need for the adhesive filled shrink tube. Once done, here you can see the finalized harness. Another couple connections will be made inside the truck and just before the finalized installation the wiring will then be held together using cable ties. Any wires which won't be used can have adhesive fill shrink tube installed on the ends to close them off. However, Pumpkin has already done this. Remove the brackets from the factory Toyota radio. There will be alignment tabs in these brackets. One tab on each bracket did cause some interference. I did use pliers to break it off then cleaned the remainder up using a file. These brackets are soft, so they're fairly easy to file that clean break. Using the supplied screws from Pumpkin, these are the correct length so they won't push against any components inside, install the brackets. While there are four holes, three only can be used for each bracket. The radio bezel did require some mild modifications to make it fit. The opening did require some filing. You need to remove about a sixteenth of an inch or two millimeters of plastic all the way around. Take your time. 
The outer plastic can be taped off if you wish to protect the outer finish. The corners are then finished up with a rat tail file for a clean radius. When done, the opening can be finished up with 800 grit sandpaper so there's no rough edges left from the file. On the rear I also used a rotary tool to cut away the plastic brace on the top and bottom as it was interfering with the head unit's frame. Instead of a rotary tool, a hot knife can also be used. When done you should be left with a tight and smooth fitment, no need for any radio installation kits. In the truck, for the reverse camera, in order for the head unit to turn on for the video mode for the backup camera, the labeled camera wire gets connected to the red wire on the video cable. This connection was soldered and had heat shrink applied. Those extra connections on the harness, while they do have caps, they can still fall out so I wrapped them up with electrical tape just to be safe. They are wide off to the harness so they do have power. Next is organizing all the wiring using cable ties. This will keep everything clean, reduce the chance of the wires becoming damaged, and it's easier to push everything back inside the dashboard. I have left the GPS and Wi-Fi wires on their own just to reduce any chance of interference. The GPS antenna has a magnetic base. It should be attached to a metal base to amplify the signal. I stuck it on the metal tube brace inside the dashboard. Then as a little extra security, I used a cable tie to hold it into place. The antenna should have direct view through the windshield. You may need to remove the HVAC panel, it's only held into place with three Phillips screws. Here's a view of the finalized wiring. Now is installing the head unit. Typically I like to start with the longest wires first, as they are the easiest to install. Connect the GPS and Wi-Fi antennas. These are a threaded connection and get snugged up with an 8mm wrench. Connect the main power plug for the head unit. Plug in the connection for the dual USB ports coming from the glove box. Connect the hands-free microphone jack. Connect the antenna wire. And finally the video cable for the backup camera. If you wish, you can double check everything to make sure it does work by hooking up the battery temporary and then turning on the head unit. The only function I didn't hook up was the safety wire for the parking brake switch. The reason for this is that the wires are quite hard to access underneath the dashboard. Leaving this disconnected may go against local laws depending on where you are. An alternative route would be running a separate switch. Push all the wires into the dashboard, make sure nothing gets pinched. You can reach up underneath the dash in the center area to pull those wires as needed. Then install the four fasteners and tighten. Finally is the reinstallation of all the other components that were removed in reverse of removal. First is starting with the driver's side knee panel. Reinstall the bezel, start with connecting the wires at the bottom as they are shorter and you'll have easier access when it's out. Reconnect the passenger side airbag switch. Make sure no wires are pinched while pushing everything back into place. These clips may not align with the holes and that can prevent the trim from seating correctly so be mindful of that. Install the screws around the HVAC panel. Snap in the HVAC panel. Push in the knobs. Install the screw at the bottom. Reinstall the lower trim piece, first connecting the electrical plugs. Make sure no wires are being pinched again, then push it into place. My side clips were missing, so I replaced those with generic fir tree style clips. And finally the ashtray. For the driver's side, only two pieces of trim are left. First is the kick panel, which pushes into place. Make sure the tabs are aligned for the slots. Snap the rocker panel trim into place, and then install the four Phillips screws. If you haven't already, reconnect the battery. Once done, here you can see how the head unit sits in the dashboard. There is a tight fit all the way around the perimeter of the unit. No need for any bracket adjustments. It's easily reachable and viewable for the driver, and the truck now has new tech features. I will have a finalized walkthrough and review of this head unit next week. However, as a brief overview, this is the 7-inch Android 9.0 head unit made by Pumpkin. A link to this will be included in the video description. It has an 8-core processor, 4 gigs of RAM, and 32 gigs of storage. It has external USB ports, a micro SD card can be installed behind a hidden cover on the face. The truck now has a backup camera, Wi-Fi connectivity to surf the internet, 
navigation can play videos supports the torque app which is able to show live data of your vehicle through a bluetooth obd2 reader apple carplay and android auto compatible and more new videos released every week on my channel be sure to hit that thumbs up button it's a huge help to me and leave a comment below if you found this tutorial helpful don't forget to follow my social media pages such as facebook twitter and instagram to keep up to date with my latest projects and if you're not a subscriber be sure to hit that subscribe button thank you for watching